As we look ahead to the red wave, potentially a red tsunami, potentially a big blue wall if the Democrats steal the election, there are five races that I'm really, really focused on. We'll get to all the big Senate races and everything that people are talking about in Pennsylvania and Georgia. The biggest race that I am watching on election night is New York's 17th congressional district for two reasons. One, it's legitimately a bellwether. This is a seat that's been held by Republicans and by Democrats. Everyone thinks that New Yorkers are all big libs, but there are a lot of conservatives there as well. It's a seat that is currently held by the head of the DCCC. This is the Democrat Congressional Campaign Committee, Sean Patrick Maloney. And then the second reason is, that's my district. That's where I grew up. That's where I first came up in politics. I have worked multiple campaigns in this district. A winning campaign in 2010 for my friend Nan Hayworth. People said we couldn't win. It's a liberal New York. And then what happens? Nan and a number of other Republicans go ahead and win the seat. Next time around, a Democrat won that seat. Nan lost the race. We were all very upset. The Democrats name Sean Patrick Maloney, the man who still has that seat. Why did the Democrat win? Redistricting. So what it's going to tell you is which way is the country moving? Which way is the swing district going to swing? Pretty serious potential pickup for the Republicans. And it would be, I think, the first time in history that the head of the Democrat Congressional Campaign Committee would lose his seat while he's running the DCCC. Very exciting and a personal vendetta for me. Next up is the Georgia Senate race. Everybody is watching this race. It's Herschel Walker, who's a legend in Georgia, running against Raphael Warnock, who's a socialist. Warnock is the incumbent, though he hasn't been in the seat for very long. And you got Walker coming in. That looks really good for the Republicans. I wouldn't, wouldn't uh, rest easy, though. I don't think this is the time for complacency. Uh, because there can be shenanigans in Georgia. I know that we're not allowed to talk about election shenanigans, and every single election that the Democrats run is the most wonderful, dignified, totally absent any sort of fraud sort of election ever. But that's just not the case. There, there were legitimate questions raised about the way Georgia conducted its elections in 2020. If it's really a nail biter, I do fear that you could get some broken water pipes and some <laughs> absentee ballots coming in at the very last moment. The reason that Herschel Walker should feel somewhat confident, though, is the Democrats tried their October surprise these salacious claims that Herschel Walker had all sorts of terrible relations with women and he slept around a lot. There was the suggestion that he paid for an abortion, even though Herschel's a very strong pro-life candidate. Real gutter politics, really disgusting stuff. And it didn't work, actually. Herschel raised money after these attacks. Herschel was not really hurt all that much in the polls, and he continues to lead in the polls down there. So this, this is a, a pretty strong position. The same cannot quite be said about Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania is Dr. Oz versus John Fetterman. It's similar to the Georgia race in that Dr. Oz is leading right now. What was the big turning point here. It was that debate between Dr. Oz and John Fetterman because John Fetterman suffered a stroke and has brain damage and can't speak. The main problem for Fetterman is not actually the stroke. He's completely out of touch with the voters of Pennsylvania. So Fetterman said his number one priority, if he had a magic wand, the first thing he would do is let murderers out of prison, <laughs> which is a very far left fantasy, I guess. Doesn't play in Pittsburgh especially when crime is going up. And then the other problem for Fetterman is he said, I oppose fracking. And when energy costs are hitting record highs, this is not something that you wanna hear, especially in Pennsylvania. Even for the greatest, slickest, Bill Clinton, Bubba politician, fastest talker you ever heard, he would have been in a very, very tough position to work around his, his terrible, policy stances. But then you add on top of that, that Fetterman can barely form an English sentence right now. It's no surprise after the debate, the polls all start to turn for Dr. Oz. Now, the problem also with Pennsylvania is it's a corrupt state. The Democrat secretaries of state and the people who are running the elections are not to be trusted. They do some dodgy things and ballots are going to come in in the middle of the night, especially in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is notorious for this. Forget about the 2020 election where there were a lot of questions raised. This goes back many years before that. That would be one reason to be a little worried. Some Republicans right now are taking solace because they say, oh, there's a wonderful Supreme Court decision that just came down in Pennsylvania where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court says that the Secretary of State cannot count mail-in ballots that do not have a date on them. And a lot of Republicans are saying, oh, good, this is going to help us win. This is going to make it harder for the Democrats to cheat. My reaction is almost the opposite, though, because when I see a decision like that, I see the Pennsylvania Supreme Court 
is recognizing what I am recognizing too, which is that the Pennsylvania Democrats want to cheat and often do cheat. So the very fact that you need this ridiculously obvious court decision, no, you're not allowed to vote after election day, <laughs> the fact that the Supreme Court has to say that shows you how bad the problem is in Pennsylvania. Polling right now looks very good for Dr. Oz, but there could be plenty of shenanigans. Then the next race we got to look at, that would be Arizona. There's a good governor's race there too, but the one I'm focused on is the Senate. That would be Blake Masters, versus Mark Kelly. The reason this race matters in particular, beyond the questions of who's gonna control the Senate, the Republicans or the Democrats, the reason the race matters is actually more about the future of the Republican Party. Because Blake Masters has positioned himself as a candidate of the new right. He has thrown out all the stale platitudes of the last 15, 20 years of GOP politics. He, he aired a campaign ad, he said, I think the 2020 election was stolen. I think Donald Trump won. Whoa, that's a, that's a shocking statement for a mainstream candidate to say. He aired a campaign ad. Blake Masters said, I think that in America, a family should be able to live on one income. Very conservative, very traditional. You would not have heard that kind of stuff from the GOP. The other thing that Blake Masters does very well is that while he is a candidate of the new right and he's representing a lot of traditional conservative views, he also appeals to libertarians. In that final couple of weeks of the campaign, you saw the libertarian candidate who could have acted as a spoiler in Arizona. He drops out of the race and he endorses Blake Masters and tells his followers to support Masters as well. It's very impressive the way he manages to walk that line. He brings the party together in a way that I think is putting it in a much, much smarter direction than it previously had been going. This kind of squishy, give up the whole country, give up the whole culture, just cut my corporate taxes kind of, kind of position. He's not alienating the libertarians, for instance. He's not alienating other parts of that right-wing coalition. So I hope he wins. He probably faces the biggest uphill challenge right now, but the polls are looking very good for him. And especially because you're, you're in a position now where, where the president is saying that, uh, half of the country is fascist and terrorist and, and they're Ill illegitimate people in our political system, I, I think probably they're being underrepresented in the polls. For my last race that I'm watching, I'm watching Ohio. As goes Ohio, so goes the nation. Uh, J.D. Vance versus Tim Ryan. It's a similar race to what we're looking at in Arizona, a lot of similar stakes here. It's about who controls the Senate, the Republicans or the Democrats, but it's really about who controls the Republican Party. Which direction is the Republican Party going to go in? Is it gonna just go in the Chamber of Commerce, give up the whole culture, or is it going to go in the conserve anything at all direction? <laughs> it's, we haven't even conserved the women's bathroom at this point. J.D. is running very firmly on that side of things. J.D. is running on, on Hillbilly Elegy. You know, he's the author of that book that, that talked about a lot of the issues that animated the Trump 2016 campaign, J.D. got the endorsement in his primary against Josh Mandel by Donald Trump. He's running on pro-family policies. He thinks that public policy, the government, should work to strengthen the family. He's spoken of the, the Hungarian pro-family policies, actually. Now, the squishy side of the GOP hates that idea. They, they hate the government. They just want to let the private corporations I don't know, censor us and destroy our whole culture. But the new right, the conservatives, the traditionalists, the regular old run of the mill, used to be a common, normal conservative American, they say, no, we've had family breakdown that has been driven in large part by the government. Politics is just how we all get along together. Politics is how we live together in a community and hopefully flourish. And so we need, we need to get rid of the policies that are destroying the family, and we need policies that are going to strengthen it. J.D. Vance has done that. So it just draws a very clear line away from the loser policies of the GOP and the conservatives of the last 20 years toward a much more coherent kind of conservatism. I think it's gonna pay off. There are fewer voter fraud kind of worries in Ohio than we've got in other states like Pennsylvania or Georgia. So things are looking about as good as they can heading into election night. Those are the races that I am watching. Obviously, it's about who controls the Senate. Obviously, it's about impeding the Biden agenda. But it's about more than that. It's about these macro trends. Not only what do, do the next two years look like or the next four years look like, what do the next 20, 30, 40 years look like as the conservatives take on a new kind of a character and, and present a governing agenda that seems a lot more popular with a lot more people. Now, we've got a ton more Daily Wire coverage of the election. You gotta tune in on Tuesday night 
to Daily Wire's election night coverage, and we'll see you there.